Hi, and welcome back. We're going to get into our message. But first, I'd like to remind you that if you would like to make, to make a contribution to Lifeway, you can uh, in a couple of ways. Our giving page is www.lifewaychurchvista.com, or check can be mailed to the church office at Lifeway Baptist Church, 1120 Highland, Vista, California, 92083. I'm going to read um, the Christmas story that, as presented by Luke in his gospel, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. It says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel of the Lord said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who, were, <clears throat> who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. I think if you're like... Pretty much anybody, you know, your plans for this year uh, look much different at the end of the year than they probably did at the beginning. And what you see on the screen there is a, a little vision board that we put out in January. We talked about the things, you know, we, like many people, we took, <laughs> made, took advantage of the fact that this is 2020 and the idea with your vision is you want to have 2020 vision. So what are the things that we're going to try and do? Well. If you look at this board, it really isn't much of the reality of what 2020 was here at Lifeway. Uh, the light, this was, uh, 2020 was the, set, the 50th anniversary of our church, uh, which was founded in 1970. We had a big celebration planned for that, and it did not happen. Uh, we have, all, every, every summer, for as long as anyone here can remember, we've had Vacation Bible School. We've had lots of kids. Um, come and uh and and we and we do our our vbs uh again this year because of covid that didn't happen uh so many of the things that we plan to do just plain didn't happen and that's probably true in your life as well um but the important thing to see is that even in the story that i just read and it looks like such a well thought out finely honed uh plan that went off without a hitch and that's true from heaven's perspective. It went off just the way that it was supposed to. But realistically, if you look at it from human perspective, everybody involved in the, in the Christmas story pretty much had their plans messed up. One of my favorite verses in the scripture, because it always keeps me uh, focused on God and not myself, but it's Proverbs 19.21 which says many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. They say, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> and I think that, uh, I don't know if that's really fair. I think God appreciates when we 
dream and, and imagine and, and, and have vision for, for godly things. But the truth is, God's plans are bigger than ours. And we can, it's so easy to think, oh, wouldn't it be nice or it'd be great if, or uh, I have this great idea. But really, it's God's purpose that is going to prevail. And if you look at the first Christmas, you look at the characters of the Christmas story, and you see that the, what happened on that first Christmas was not the things that they were thinking of. Uh, Mary and Joseph would, of course, be the first and probably the biggest example. Here you have Mary, who by all accounts is probably a teenager, a young teenager, maybe 14 to 16 years old. She's just gotten engaged to this man, and they're thinking, wow, this is, she's thinking, wow, this is great. Uh, we're going to get married. We're going to start a life together. I'm going to be a wife. We'll probably have children and have a family. And all of a sudden, she gets a visit from an angel that tells her that she is going to be pregnant, not by a man, but by God, even as a virgin, and she will give birth to a child. His name will be Jesus, and he'll be the Savior of the world. Well, that's a little different than what she had in her, in her mind as well. And then you go on to look at Joseph, who thinks that he has just gotten engaged to uh, this woman who is a virgin, and they're gonna, he's going to work, and he's going to be the provider for their, their family, and they'll probably have a family, and probably thinking, well, we're going to stay in Nazareth, which was a, a pretty small town, even by Israel, Israeli standards at that time. Boy, did their plans get messed up. Not long from after that, they're on a donkey on their way from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Mary is pregnant, and they're about to have this child that was prophesied and promised to them. The Magi were uh, wise people. Many people think those who looked at and, and, and saw the stars, and this night uh, they saw a star that changed their life forever. Their plans were probably to hang out at the university or the think tank and think smart thoughts and be the wise people that they were. But when they saw that star, they dropped everything and they headed to follow that star. It wasn't in their plans, but it was in God's plans for them. King Herod was a man who was the uh, king of uh, Israel at that time, but it was really hard for him because he wasn't really a Jew. And so he was very um, nervous about, <laughs> to say the least, he was very nervous about his place and was always kind of looking over his shoulder. So when the Magi came and looking for a king in Israel, um, Herod just went crazy. and His thoughts of a peaceful kingdom were uh, overtaken by paranoid, th paranoid, paranoid thoughts of how do I keep my position here. The Jewish and religious leaders uh, had their thoughts and their plans too. Their plans were, on the one hand, how do we continue to curry favor with the Romans coast so we can keep our, um, our, our favored place in society, but also they, they really were wanting and desiring uh, the Messiah to come. It had been prophesied in the Old Testament. It was what all the, the Jewish people were looking at for religiously and spiritually. And they were hoping for this political Messiah who would overthrow Rome and, uh, and, and allow the Jews to, to, to rule their own homeland again. So when Jesus shows up as a baby, God in human flesh, and he says things like, love your enemies, um, and things like that that went completely contrary to what they were thinking for all of thinking about and hoping for their plans went away too and yet even though with all of these messed up plans you still see God's purpose is prevailing because man makes his plans and we make many of them but it's God's purpose that will prevail and we see that on the first Christmas and hopefully we'll see that in our lives as well. Because I would say every one of us at the beginning of this year had some plans and some thoughts that we were going to pursue. And then looking back on 2020 with so much, <laughs> so much of it gone and so little of it left, we're thinking, what happened? Those weren't the plans. What happened to all the ideas and thoughts and dreams that I had? Well, it's my hope and my prayer that we'll all take the opportunity to say, God, what is your purpose and how can we see your purpose prevailing? because we know that it always does. So it's important to see uh, three truths about messed up plans. And the first is when God messes up your plans, he's trying to get your attention. You know, I think far too often, and especially in our society today, 
Uh, it's not that we're disobedient. It's just that we're not really paying attention. I mean, honestly, when God calls, do you, does he get the you? Does he get the busy signal? Uh, we've got so much going on in life. I like to say we have more time-saving devices than any time in history, and yet somehow we still manage to have less time. And so with our everyday lives caught up too much in the world in many cases, it's easy to miss when God is trying to call us. Imagine the angel Gabriel coming to Mary and Mary saying, well, I've got to watch, I'm on um, Instagram right now or I'm on Facebook right now, I'm too busy, can you please get back to me? And yet I'm afraid that for, for many of us that would probably be the response um, when, when God tries to get our attention. So sometimes he does things that have to mess up our plans for us to fully get our attention. Psalm 81.13 says, If my people would but listen to me, if Israel would follow my ways. And I wonder but what God doesn't say that a lot today. If only they would just listen. I've got a plan that is so much bigger than their plan, and yet it's so hard for me to try to get their attention. Proverbs 16.25 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. And that's such an important concept to understand. Uh, so many times we just think, oh, we've got this great idea. If we could just pursue this, when, you know, as, as James said, well, I'm going to go to such and such city and do such and such and make such and such profit. But, you know, you don't even, we don't even know. Our, um, our number could be up tomorrow. Uh, that's why it's so important to realize that God's plans are always better than our plans. Second, when God messes up your plans, he has a better idea. When God messes up your plans, he has a better idea. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. When I was growing up, Ford Motor Company had these commercials that always said, Ford has a better idea, and a little light would go off. Well, the truth is, God has a better idea. And as wonderful as you may feel like your plans are for you, and your plans for yourself probably don't include hard times and suffering or, or challenges in any way, but just a, a straight uphill to the good life that you desire, which isn't rarely uh, God's way, if I read the Bible correctly. But God really does have a better idea, and his plans for us are not to do us harm, but to give us hope and a future. So often we need to understand that, that we don't have a godly perspective, and I've talked about this uh, many times here at our church, but if you look at the Rose Bowl, at the Tournament of Roses Parade, which who knows if that'll even happen this year, but everybody who goes, human who goes to that parade sits in a bleacher or sits on the street corner, and they watch the parade go by them. But God's perspective is he's the one in the helicopter looking down on the parade. He can see the beginning of the parade. He can see the end of the parade. He can see everything in between and where the turns are um, and what's, what's going to be happening. Because our perspective is so limited, uh, we need to trust God who sees everything. As I say, I may not know what the future holds, but I do know who holds the future. That is God. And that's why in challenging times, the most important thing for us is to pursue with our whole hearts our relationship with God, who does know the future and has all wisdom. A beautiful verse that Paul, from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verses 6 through 10, he says, We do not how we do, excuse me, let me start over. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would, have not, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Just let me pause there for a minute. Once again, if if the if if those who were alive at the time of Jesus' birth had seen the full picture from God's perspective, um, how they responded to Jesus, how their plans, uh, how they fought the the messing up their plans would have been much different. Verse nine. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. 
but God has revealed it to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Not even the internet, not even Google or Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat can search the deep things of God. That's why we're so blessed to have the Holy Spirit. We're so blessed to have a God who loves us and cares for us and whose plans are so great for us. What we need to understand is so many times it's easier to choose our plans because God's plan is usually bigger. If it's bigger, it requires more out of us. It's usually more rewarding. Uh, no pain, no gain. So if you go for a goal that's more rewarding, rewarding, generally it's going to take more hard work, more sweat equity. Um, it's just going to be harder to achieve. God's plan is usually more enduring. Even if we fulfill the plans and the goals that we have, it may have an effect for like a generation. But when we fulfill God's plans, it's for eternity. God's plan is usually harder than our plan. But if you don't go with God's plan, you limit your life. Don't be content with just anything that be, uh, that's in your brain because your human mind can think of it. Hope for more. Hope for more in your life. Look for bigger plans. Pray to God that you would be used as fully as possible. Consider Mary. She adop adapted on to God's plans, and I think some of the greatest words of faith are the ones where Mary said to the angel, Let it be done to me as you have said. I mean, here, here the, the angel has just spouted off all this incredible stuff that is going to make Mary's life hard. It's going to put all eyes on Mary. And yet she said in faith, Hey, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be done to me as you have said. We live in a much different world. Not even if the whole world said that, but just those who truly are the Lord's servants. It said, I am your servant. Let it be done to me as you said. Consider what Mary went through. Nine months of sideways looks and glances. Uh, I thought she was the virgin Mary. I thought she wasn't married yet. Is she a virgin? If she's pregnant, who's the father? Then on top of that, going through all that, then you have to get on a donkey and ride to Bethlehem and give your, have your baby in a, in a manger, in a stable, because there's no room at the inn. And so we have this glorified picture, I mean, of what C Christmas night was like, because we have all of our Christmas lights and special effects and all the things we do to our houses to decorate in that. Uh, I was blessed once to help a friend of mine who ran a recovery ranch um, not in, in Warner Springs, California, and I would go and just so he could have a day off every week, and I'd go and spend the night there and uh, then kind of watch... <laughs> watch the ranch and do some teaching and counseling uh, so that so, as he had that day off. And uh, at that ranch were horses and goats and lots of other animals who do what animals do as natural behavior. And so they always had a sign every year that said, welcome to the true sights and sounds of Christmas. That's what it is. We have a glamorized view with lights and we probably have air fresheners and air purifiers going and we smell nice pine trees and that's our, our scent and thought at Christmas but for the real uh, sight and sights and sounds of Christmas for Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus it was a stable with animals who probably didn't smell all that great consider Mary she allowed God's plan to prevail in her life even though it was harder it was it, it, it will endure forever Number three, when God messes up your plans, he's teaching you to trust him. It sounds kind of counterintuitive, but the, the reality is, is that if everything goes the way we expect it to, we don't really learn to trust God. Because we, if we don't, can't trust him in the challenging times in life, in the COVID times of life, in the hard times of life, do we really trust him at all? Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. This year, don't, do, don't just do your Christmas seeking on the internet. Now, because especially with COVID and everything, it's easy just to seek out that gift online and you click the button and Yahoo, you, you found it. 
the greatest search you can do this Christmas is the search the wise men or the magi went through almost 2,000 years ago when they went out on a, a, a search to find Jesus. I hope and pray that that's what your heart is really searching for now. The Bible says, the promise in Jeremiah is that if we will do that, that we will find him if we search for him, if we seek after him with our entire, entire heart. The way we honor God is with faith. And again, you look at the, the, uh, story, the, the characters in the Christmas story, Mary and Joseph, incredible faith to believe what God had told them. Even the shepherds, seeing the star, being woken up by an angel, said, go and find, go here and find Jesus. And they did. Uh, the Magi, all that long journey, just because they're what they saw a star. It takes faith to please God. That's what the Bible says. Hebrews 11, 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And uh, I like to highlight the word earnestly there, because it's easy to say, Oh, yeah, I, man, I wish God would show himself to me. I, but man, do you earnestly seek God? When you wake up, from the time you wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night, are your thoughts about trying to find and connect uh, the true and the living God? The important thing to see is whatever God's plans are for you, He has gifted you to do it. And the saddest thing, I mean, consider, I, I don't even know if I know you, but if you gave me a gift for Christmas and you sent it to my house via Amazon or whatever, and then one day it few months down the road you say well I want to go check in on that guy I sent the gift to and I open the door and you come in and there in the, my living room the Christmas tree is still up and under that tree is the gift that you sent me completely unwrapped what would you think about me I think I was you probably think I was pretty ungrateful uh, not caring and disrespectful towards you and towards your gift and yet the Bible is clear that each and every one of us have received uh, who are who are believers have received a gift that God expects us to use for his kingdom and for his glory. That's why it's so important that we are constantly seeking God and we're constantly putting into effect the faith that God ca calls us to have. So that we have by f when we have that faith and we believe in the things even though we don't see them, that's when we please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And the whole Christmas story, even though it involved a bunch of messed up plans, is a testimony to the faith of those who participated in the birth of Jesus. The challenge is to go after God's plans and not our own. And the warning signs that you may be experienced because you're trying to fulfill your own plan are fatigue, fear, and frustration. When we take ownership of our own life and our own plans and things don't go the way that we want, then it's going to wear us out. We're going to be fearful that we're not doing it right and we're going to be frustrated when things don't happen the way we expect. But if we can truly have the faith to trust God and His plan for ourselves, for our families, for our communities, for our country, even for the world, then we can relax knowing that God has it all in control just as he did the first Christmas night. Psalm 138, verse 8 says, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. That's a promise. Jesus land, uh, ending up being born on the first Christmas, so many years ago was the fulfillment of many Old Testament promises and prophecies. God has promises for your life as well, and he promises that he will fulfill his purpose for you. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. We can trust God in that. It's important to realize some things that this verse does not say, though. It does not say that all things are good. It 
says that God works for the good, not for everybody, but for those who love him, those who have been called according to his purpose. Joseph and Mary went on an incredible journey, and not everything was easy, not everything was good, but they were going because they'd been called according to his purpose. And God made it beautiful. Perhaps one of the most beautiful nights in all of history. What this image is, is of a, a moon tower. And I learned this recently. I never realized it because I've <laughs> only been alive since 1960. But in the late 1800s, when ele electricity was just starting to become popular in terms of being in, in houses, so many people at that time lived without electricity and in their house. I know that's hard for us to believe, but because um, so few people actually had indoor electricity, the plan was to light up the evening because everybody knows light at night is good. It's good to see where you're going. Today we don't think about it because we've got individual uh, street lights and people have lights up, you know, at their door and that. But originally the thought was, well, we'll just try to, to light up an area. So they had what were called moon towers. And many were built in the 1880s and 1890s uh, in our country and in England. And the idea was that, that they would light up a neighborhood. Well, as electricity got more and more prevalent and they were able to do, you know, even the gas lamps on the, on the streets and electric lights and everybody having their front porch light, the, the, the one individual light that was supposed to light up a, a great area went by the wayside. In a way, there's a spiritual application to that as well. Jesus came. He said, I am the light of the world. John 1, 9 says, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Jesus came and he lit up the whole world. But Jesus has gone back to heaven now. So what about the light? Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So just like... We, the, there was a transfer from the moonlight that was supposed to light up a whole area into individual street lights and porch lights and things like that. So now, when Jesus was here, he lit up the whole world. But now he has said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, we need to let our light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You may feel like your plans for 2020 have been messed up, but if you have an opportunity to shine your light, then you can be fulfilling God's purpose for you. I thank you for joining me today. And just in conclusion, you're probably one of three people. You're probably either a seeker, a saved, or a stumbler. And seekers are great. They're people who maybe haven't crossed the line and said, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to take up my cross daily and follow him. But they're interested. You're interested in spiritual things. Or perhaps you're saved. You have crossed the line. You've given your life to Jesus and you're, you're following him. Perhaps you're a stumbler who made that commitment at, at one point, but now you just don't feel like you're, you're walking in it the way that God calls you to. Today, you have the opportunity to be a light in this world, to follow the true light. And I'm, please follow along with me as I pray. Before I pray, you can contact me at our, life, at our website, lifewaychurchvista.com. There's a connection card thing where you can give me your name and address, and I'll be happy to get back in touch with you. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray for the people here who are seekers, and we've looked at scriptures that say that if we seek you, we will find you. And I pray that um, those who are seeking you would seek you with their whole hearts, especially at Christmas, how you moved heaven and earth to have a little baby born in a stable in Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago. Something that seemed perhaps very small and minute at that time, but has changed the world ever since Jesus came. I just pray that they would see the true light that shines in the darkness. His name is Jesus. 
Lord, for the saved who are watching, I pray that we would always unwrap the gifts that you have given and promised to us. I pray that we would not be content to say that there is a light, but we would actually be the light and that the light would shine in the darkness and the darkness would not be over, able to overcome it because you are our source, Lord. Lord, I pray for the saved at this time, Lord, that we will not let um, messed up plans mess up our relationship with you or our calling or our purpose in life, but we'll run after you harder and with more purpose. Perhaps you're someone who feels like you've kind of stumbled away. Maybe you uh, went at one time in your life were walking with the Lord and pursuing him, and now the cares of the world have come and kind of messed that up for you. Well, that's a big mess up, and it's my prayer for you that at this Christmas time you will move toward the light, that you will seek him with your whole heart because he can be found by you, and you'll get back on track. There's no plan that anyone as a human can make that is bigger than God's plan. So the best thing we can do is to humble ourselves and come back to the true light. His name is Jesus. Lord, I pray that as we celebrate uh, Christmas this year, it will really be about the most important aspect of Christmas, that the light is shine, shines in the darkness, and the darkness will not overtake it. And we want to be on the side of the light. Thank you. God bless you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Again, thank you for joining uh, me today, and we will see you next week. God bless.